Chapter Eleven of the Alhambra: A Series of Tales and Sketches of the Moors and Spaniards by Washington Irving. This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. Chapter Eleven: The Balcony. In the Hall of Ambassadors, at the central window, there is a balcony of which I have already made mention. It projects like a cage from the face of the tower, high in mid-air above the tops of the trees that grow on the steep hillside. It answers me as a kind of observatory where I often take my seat to consider not merely the heavens above, but the earth beneath. Beside the magnificent prospect which it commands of mountain, valley, and vega, there is a busy little scene of human life laid open to inspection immediately below. At the foot of the hill is an alameda, or public walk, which, though not so fashionable as the more modern and splendid paseo of the Henil, still boasts a varied and picturesque concourse, especially on holy days and Sundays. Hither resort the small gentry of the suburbs, together with priests and friars, who walk for appetite and digestion majos and majas the bows and bells of the lower classes in their andalusian dresses swagging contrabandistas and sometimes half-muffled and mysterious loungers of the higher ranks on some silent assignation it is a moving picture of spanish life which i delight to study and as the naturalist has his microscope to assist him in his curious investigations, so I have a small pocket telescope which brings the countenances of the motley groups so close as almost at times to make me think I can divine their conversation by the play and expression of their features. I am thus, in a manner, an invisible observer, and without quitting my solitude can throw myself in an instant into the midst of society a rare advantage to one of somewhat shy and quiet habits then there is a considerable suburb lying below the alhambra filling the narrow gorge of the valley and extending up the opposite hill of the albaixin many of the houses are built in the moorish style round patios or courts cooled by fountains and open to the sky and as the inhabitants pass much of their time in these courts and on the terraced roofs during the summer season it follows that many a glance at their domestic life may be obtained by an aerial spectator like myself who can look down on them from the clouds i enjoy in some degree the advantages of the student in the famous old spanish story who beheld all madrid unroofed for his inspection and my gossiping squire mateo jimenez officiates occasionally as my asmodeus to give me anecdotes of the different mansions and their inhabitants i prefer however to form conjectural histories for myself and thus can sit up aloft for hours weaving from casual incidents and indications that pass under my eye the whole tissue of schemes intrigues and occupations carrying on by certain of the busy mortals below us there is scarce a pretty face or striking figure that i daily see about which i have not thus gradually framed a dramatic story though some of my characters will occasionally act in direct opposition to the part assigned them and disconcert my whole drama a few days since as i was reconnoitring with my glass the streets of the albaixin i beheld the procession of a novice about to take the veil and remarked various circumstances that excited the strongest sympathy in the fate of the youthful being thus about to be consigned to a living tomb. I ascertained, to my satisfaction, that she was beautiful, and by the paleness of her cheek that she was a victim rather than a votary. 
She was arrayed in bridal garments, and decked with a chaplet of white flowers ; but her heart evidently revolted at this mockery of a spiritual union, and yearned after its earthly loves. A tall, stern looking man walked near her in the procession ; it was evidently the tyrannical father, who, from some bigoted or sordid motive, had compelled this sacrifice. Amidst the crowd was a dark, handsome youth, in Andalusian garb, who seemed to fix on her an eye of agony. It was doubtless the secret lover from whom she was for ever to be separated. My indignation rose as I noted the malignant exultation painted in the countenances of the attendant monks and friars. The procession arrived at the chapel of the convent. The sun gleamed for the last time upon the chaplet of the poor novice as she crossed the fatal threshold and disappeared from sight. The throng poured in with cowl and cross and minstrelsy. The lover paused for a moment at the door. I could understand the tumult of his feelings, but he mastered them and entered. There was a long interval. I pictured to myself the scene passing within. The poor novice, despoiled of her transient finery, clothed in the conventual garb, the bridal chaplet taken from her brow, her beautiful head shorn of its long silken tresses. I heard her murmur the irrevocable vow. I saw her extended on her bier, the death pall spread over, the funeral service performed that proclaimed her dead to the world. Her sighs were drowned in the wailing anthem of the nuns and the sepulchral tones of the organ. The father looked unmoved, without a tear. The lover, no, my fancy refused to portray the anguish of the lover. There the picture remained a blank. The ceremony was over. The crowd again issued forth to behold the day and mingle in the joyous stir of life, but the victim with her bridal chaplet was no longer there. The door of the convent closed that secured her from the world forever. I saw the father and the lover issue forth. They were in earnest conversation. The young man was violent in his gestures when the wall of a house intervened and shut them from my sight. That evening I noticed a solitary light twinkling from a remote lattice of the convent. There, said I, the unhappy novice sits weeping in her cell, while her lover paces the street below in unavailing anguish. The officious Mateo interrupted my meditations and destroyed in an instant the cobweb tissue of my fancy. With his usual zeal he had gathered facts concerning the scene that had interested me. The heroine of my romance was neither young nor handsome, she had no lover, she had entered the convent of her own free will as a respectable asylum, and was one of the cheerfulest residents within its walls. I felt at first half vexed with the nun for being thus happy in her cell, in contradiction to all the rules of romance, but diverted my spleen by watching for a day or two the pretty coquetries of a dark-eyed brunette, who from the covert of a balcony shrouded with flowering shrubs and a silken awning, was carrying on a mysterious correspondence with a handsome, dark, well-whiskered cavalier in the street beneath her window. Sometimes I saw him, at an early hour, stealing forth, wrapped to the eyes in a mantle. Sometimes he loitered at the corner, in various disguises, apparently waiting for a private signal to slip into the bower. Then there was a tinkling of a guitar at night, and a lantern shifted from place to place in the balcony. I imagined another romantic intrigue, like that of Alma Viva, but was again disconcerted in all my suppositions by being informed that the supposed lover was the husband of the lady, 
and a noted contrabandista, and that all his mysterious signs and movements had doubtless some smuggling scheme in view. Scarce had the gray dawn streaked the sky, and the earliest cock crowed from the cottages of the hillside, when the suburbs gave sign of reviving animation. For the fresh hours of dawning are precious in the summer season in a sultry climate. All are anxious to get the start of the sun in the business of the day. The muleteer drives forth his loaded train for the journey. The traveller slings his carbine behind his saddle and mounts his steed at the gate of the hostel. The brown peasant urges his loitering donkeys, laden with panniers of sunny fruit and fresh dewy vegetables for already the thrifty housewives are hastening to the market. The sun is up and sparkles along the valley, topping the transparent foliage of the groves. The matin bells resound melodiously through the pure bright air, announcing the hour of devotion. The muleteer halts his burdened animals before the chapel, thrusts his staff through his belt behind, and enters with hat in hand smoothing his coal-black hair to hear a mass and put up a prayer for a prosperous wayfaring across the sierra and now steals forth with fairy foot the gentle signora in trim busquina, with restless fan in hand and dark eye flashing from beneath her gracefully folded mantilla she seeks some well-frequented church to offer up her orisons but the nicely adjusted dress, the dainty shoe and cobweb stocking, the raven tresses scrupulously braided, the fresh-plucked rose that gleams among them like a gem, show that earth divides with heaven the empire of her thoughts. As the morning advances, the din of labor augments on every side, the streets are thronged with man and steed and beast of burden. The universal movement produces a hum and murmur like the surges of the ocean. As the sun ascends to his meridian, the hum and bustle gradually decline. At the height of noon there is a pause, the panting city sinks into lassitude, and for several hours there is a general repose. The windows are closed, the curtains drawn the inhabitants retired into the coolest recesses of their mansions. The full-fed monk snores in his dormitory, the brawny porter lies stretched on the pavement beside his burden. The peasant and the labourer sleep beneath the trees of the Alameda, lulled by the sultry chirping of the locust. The streets are deserted except by the water-carrier, who refreshes the ear by proclaiming the merits of his sparkling beverage, colder than mountain snow. As the sun declines there is again a gradual reviving, and when the vesper bell rings out his sinking knell, all nature seems to rejoice that the tyrant of the day has fallen. Now begins the bustle of enjoyment. The citizens pour forth to breathe the evening air, and revel away the brief twilight in the walks and gardens of the Daro and the Hinil. As the night closes, the motley scene assumes new features. Light after light gradually twinkles forth, here a taper from a balconied window, there a votive lamp before the image of a saint. Thus by degrees the city emerges from the pervading gloom and sparkles with scattered lights like the starry firmament. Now break forth from court and garden and street and lane the tinkling of innumerable guitars and the clicking of castanets, blending at this lofty height in a faint and general concert. Enjoy the moment, is the creed of the gay and amorous Andalusian, and at no time does he practice it more zealously than in the balmy nights of summer, wooing his mistress with the dance, the love ditty, and the passionate serenade. I was seated one evening in the balcony, enjoying the light breeze that came rustling along the side of the hill among the treetops, 
when my humble historiographer, Mateo, who was at my elbow, pointed out a spacious house in an obscure street of the Albaycin, about which he related, as nearly as I can recollect, the following anecdote. End of chapter 11